visibility. Early tomorrow morning of a bit of snow over the Midlands, East Anglia, possibly parts of southern England. Just for a time, not expected to last too long before that sweeps away. And then we've got sunny spells and showers. Snow showers will be turning more and more wintry, initially over hills, but down to low levels from mid-morning onwards over northern England. Western parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland could also see a mixture of sleet and snow and a much colder feel as well, especially when you add on the strength of the wind. Still that wind blowing through Friday afternoon, but easing down during Friday nights and things could then again turn icy as we keep some showers coming into the northwest. A wintry mix of showers, a chilly start to what will be a windy weekend, wet in the north on Saturday, dry in the south. Showers for all of us on Sunday. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Just, I mean, it's, it's in a lot. Good afternoon. It's three o'clock. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. The cost of living is set to soar for millions of households across the UK, with energy regulator Ofgem announcing a 54% rise in the price cap. Those on default tariffs paying by direct debit will see their bills go up by nearly £700, and prepayment customers face annual charges of more than £2,000. The change will be introduced from April the 1st, affecting around 22 million customers. Chancellor Rishi Sunak says he'll give households in council tax bans A to D an extra £350 to ease the burden. It is not sustainable to keep holding the price of energy artificially low. For me to stand here and pretend we don't have to adjust to paying higher prices would be wrong and dishonest. But what we can do is take the sting out of a significant price shock for millions of families by making sure the increase in prices is smaller initially and spread over a longer period. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves accused the government of forcing households to load up their credit cards. But what do the government offer? A buy now, pay later scheme that loads up costs for tomorrow. 
High prices as far as the eye can see. This year, next year, and the year after that. Give with one hand now and take it all back later. The party opposite used to talk about the nation's credit card. (laughs) Well, today, Mr Speaker, we've seen the Chancellor force British households to load up their credit cards. People are also facing higher mortgages following a rise in interest rates. The Bank of England is trying to curb inflation, which is set to hit 7.25% according to forecasts. The Monetary Policy Committee voted to raise rates to 0.5% and signalled more hikes are on the way. It marks the central bank's first back-to-back increase since June 2004. Energy giant Shell has managed to capitalise on the soaring gas and oil prices. The company recorded a pre-tax profit of £12 billion in the last three months of 2021. That's up from almost £900 million in the previous quarter. Shell now plans to return £6.3 billion to investors by buying back their shares. GB News understands Northern Ireland's First Minister, Paul Given, is planning to resign today. It comes amid increasing tensions over the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Officials have been ordered to stop agri-food checks, which the EU says is a breach of international law. Boris Johnson says a sensible approach is needed. What we've got to do is get to a sensible solution that recognises that it's crazy to have checks on goods that are basically circulating within the uh, single market of the United Kingdom. Now, we can do that, but without having uh, a full panoply of checks uh, on the, the GB, NI uh, coast and, and at the airport. And that's the way forward. It, I think practical common sense is what's needed. Meanwhile, hauliers are calling for clarity following the order to stop Brexit checks. Northern Ireland Policy Manager for Logistics UK, Seamus Lenny, says the sector has no idea what's going on. U.S. Special Forces say the leader of ISIS has been killed in northwest Syria. President Joe Biden announced that Abu Ibrahim al-Hashim al qaishi has now been removed from the battlefield and there were no U.S. casualties. al qaishi reportedly detonated a bomb as U.S. forces approached during an overnight raid, killing himself and at least 13 others, including women and children. Scottish Championship Club Wraith Rovers have apologised and announced they'll look to cancel Davy Goodwillie's contract. They said in a statement that they'd focused far too much on football matters and not enough on morals. The striker was found to have raped a woman by a civil court in 2017 and ordered to pay damages, but he's never faced criminal charges. Russia has criticised US plans to send more troops to Eastern Europe, describing the move as destructive. President Joe Biden has ordered nearly 3,000 military personnel to Poland and Romania to bolster NATO defences. Moscow has denied plans to invade Ukraine, but it's understood Russia's now mobilised 115,000 troops on its border. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now. It's back to the briefing with Darren McCaffrey. Yeah, hello and welcome to The Briefing PM with me, Darren McCaffrey, live in Blackpool today. We've been on our Northwest uh, week over the last couple of days, from Macclesfield to Burnley, now to Blackpool, where the Prime Minister and the uh, Secretary of State for Levelling Up, Michael Gove, will be making a visit, uh, touring at Blackpool. We'll be hearing the latest from Boris Johnson in the next couple of minutes. Also coming up in the programme today, between three and four, Stormont in crisis. Uh, one of the latest is it looks like the First Minister of Northern Ireland is about to resign. What impact could that have on politics in Northern Ireland and indeed on the Northern Ireland protocol and the trade deal between Britain and the UK? And we'll be looking at the cost of living crisis. A triple whammy today. Uh, taxes that are due to increase will remain in place just as inflation may well hit 7% and interest rates are uh, on the rise given that increase by the Bank of England. What does it mean for you in your pocket? As always, we want you to get in touch with us on the programme. You can email me at gbnews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Very good afternoon and welcome to the programme.
Yeah, it's seven minutes past three o'clock on this Thursday afternoon. We're on TV, online and, of course, on your DAB digital radio. Thank you for joining us. A uh, big day in politics today. We learned that there is going to be a big increase in the energy price cap, around up to £2,000 now that mean that household bills are going to increase substantially in the months to come. That is already going to put a big squeeze on the money that people have got in the pocket, just as inflation is now likely to hit over 7%, according to the Bank of England, and interest rates are on the rise. All this as the government insists that not only uh, does it want to uh, help people out with that, and we'll be discussing that a little later on in the programme, but also about levelling up the country, that places like here in Blackpool and elsewhere get extra government investment and extra government attention in the years to come. Well, today, Boris Johnson and Michael Gove have been here in Blackpool. Uh, let's have a listen to what the Prime Minister had to say when he answered some questions a little earlier. You've got to do everything you can at once. And as we come out of, of COVID, we, uh, we face a, a real cost of living crunch caused largely by the inflationary spikes you're seeing around the world, particularly in, in energy. And the government has to help people. And we, we are helping people, just we've helped people throughout the, the pandemic. And so what Rishi has, uh, has announced today is a, a £9 billion package to, uh, to help people with the cost of their, of their energy, very considerable support for people. Uh, and then uh, 20, uh, 27 million households will benefit from a council tax rebate worth £150 and a £200 uh, loan on top of that. So uh, a, a lot of money going in now to help people with the cost of living on top of what we're doing uh, with the living wage, with the, uh, the um, effective tax cuts for people on, uh, on universal credit. Uh, but, you know, all this investment, all this helping people uh, is only going to work if we have a sustainable uh, long-term uh, economic recovery uh, with high-wage, high-skilled jobs. And so what we're doing today is uh, putting in the investment here, for instance, in Blackpool, £22 million going into the tram network. And that is driving thousands more jobs, private sector jobs, because we think, I think, that levelling up is a fantastic mission for our country. And it's about recognising there's, there's genius and talent everywhere uh, and you need to, to unleash it. But you've got to have the private sector leading it. So for people who are facing particular hardship, of course, uh, we have, well, and for everybody, we have uh, abatements, uh, uh, things we do to help with the cost of energy, cold weather uh, payments, warm homes, discounts, and, uh, and so on. Uh, this is a mega package, a mega package of £9 billion pounds on top, uh, which is, uh, I think, you know, necessary, but it's huge. And that is there to help people with this particular spike that we're seeing right now. What I hope and believe is that eventually, as the world economy gets its, uh, back, gets its momentum back, uh, the inflationary pressures will, will start to subside. Vital thing you've got to do in order to help keep uh, inflation under control uh, is, is ease those, those pro problems in the supply chains, get people into work in the jobs where they're needed. So that's why we're also doing our way to work program, getting half a million people off welfare uh, and into work to help ease the, uh, the blockages in the UK economy, get things working more smoothly. And that is a, another, another way that you can uh, get inflation under control. Would you I hope that we can get, I, I know that uh, Liz uh, Truss is seeing Maros Sefcovic uh, again, I think, today. And that's great that the conversations are, are continuing. What we've got to, to do is get to a sensible solution that recognises that it's crazy to have checks on goods that are basically circulating within the uh, single market of the United Kingdom. What you could have, uh, of course, is a commonsensical, practical steps to, to weed out, to check on things that might be uh, at, at risk of circulation, as they say in Brussels, at risk of circulation in, uh, in Ireland uh, as well as Northern Ireland. Now, we can do that, but without having uh, a full panoply of checks uh, on the, the GBNI uh, coast and, and at the airport. And that's the way forward. It, I think practical common sense is what's needed. It's not going back, going back though, on what you agree. Actually, if you look at the protocol, which I'm sure you have studied in detail, uh, th th there's plenty about uninterrupted uh, east-west trade. Uh, the Prime Minister are talking at the end, of course, about what's happening in Belfast, and we will be in Northern Ireland a little later on 
in the programme. But first, let's focus on the cost of living crisis. Uh, today, of course, we learned that the average yearly bill when it comes to energy prices in England is likely uh, to soar by 693 quid, as I say, to almost 2,000. The Chancellor, though, announcing a £200 discount on all electricity bills today and £150 council tax rebates uh, that will be implemented a little later on this year. The Labour Party, though, saying it wants to see VAT scrapped on energy bills entirely. Joining me here in Blackpool to discuss all this is the local MP for Blackpool South Conservative, Scott Benton. Thank you very much indeed, Scott, for uh, joining us. Uh, you know, this is really serious stuff. This is average people people in work losing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds uh, this year. The Bank of England suggesting it's going to be the greatest fall in disposable income since their records began 30 years ago. That's not great for your constituents, is it? Well, welcome to Blackpool. And um, my constituency is one of the most deprived parts of England, and they are feeling this unprecedented squeeze on household living standards at the moment. But let's not forget, this is a government who already have a great story to tell in terms of what we're doing. So national living wage has been increased to £9.50. The universal credit rate has been cut from 63 pence in the pound to 55 pence, which is well, an effectively well, cut, cut, cut a £1,000. millions of pounds. Well, effectively £1,000 extra in their back pocket for two million working families. So we're doing a number of other things at present. And this announcement today is welcome. £300 per household. Firstly, to help up front with the cost of those fuel bills, which will concern many families at present. And secondly, to assist with council tax bills as well. £150, which about 95% of my constituents will be able to draw down. So household budgets are under pressure, but this is a government which is helping people like no other government before. And that might be all very well and good. And many of these things, you know, frankly, are outside the government's control. Inflation is running amok, not just, of course, in the UK. The Eurozone yesterday reported reported its uh, record number of inflation figures since the creation in the early 2000s. We know it's extraordinarily high in the United States as well. We know also energy prices. Again, that is not Britain dependent. What is Britain dependent is the third bit, the triple whammy that's going to affect people this year, and that is tax increases. No other country in the world is substantially in increasing tax at the time when everything else is going up. Why? Well, on the national insurance increase, let's not forget that 50% of that national insurance rise will be paid by the wealthiest 10% of people. So the vast majority of people in Blackpool, in work, will be uh, protected to a large degree from that national insurance rise because it's the richer people, and rightly so, who will pay most of that national insurance rise. It's still hundreds and hundreds of pounds, though, if you're an average taxpayer. Well, well, you know, it, it is a genuine tax increase. It comes at a time also when the income tax thresholds are being frozen, which means that millions more people are going to be paying the higher rate of tax. I appreciate that, but let's look at things in their entirety. So the universal credit taper rate being cut, as I said before, that's £1,000 extra for 2 million families. 9.5 um, pounds living wage as well, which will help millions of people up and down this country. So inflation is a significant concern, but it's important that we get people in well-paid jobs and help them with the cost of living, and that's what this government's long-term plan is about. Scott, I mean, the thing is that you and I can bandy around figures all afternoon about what's been said. In the end, uh, you know, the Bank of England today have said that disposable income is going to be its lowest level for at least 30 years, probably more uh, than that. And the tax burden is increasing to its highest level for 70 years. The government's got control of the tax level. It may be right, it may be the long-term right thing to do, but is it the right thing to do this April when people are already being clobbered? I mean, the, the government need to look at this again, no? Well, we've just come through a pandemic. We've spent £400 billion extra supporting people with furlough schemes, supporting people with business grants, making sure the NHS had everything it needed to get us through this pandemic. And now we're going to have to have some serious conversations as a country about what we can afford going forward. So there's unprecedented sums going in the NHS to make sure people can get the cancer appointments, get the hip replacements. And ultimately, my constituents want first-class public services police on the streets, brilliant schools, hospital appointments, being able to see the GP, and that has to be paid for from somewhere. But let's not forget, it's the rich who will stomach most of the burden of this additional yeah, tax rise. I mean, you know, average taxpayer, hundreds and hundreds of pounds going to be down in tax this year. Uh, let's talk about the, the mechanism the Chancellor's using to try and mitigate some of this. Uh, I mean, frankly, it's, it, it, I'm kind of looking through the looking gas here, glass in some ways. You've got the Labour Party saying, actually, let's just cut tax directly, VAT, which we can now 
now do with Brexit, and you've got the Conservative Party doing what traditionally the Labour Party's done, which is take your money in and then re-give re it back to you. I mean, it's not a very conservative way to do things. Surely people should be able to do with their own money what they want. Well, just in terms of what Labour are proposing to do, I mean, they're cutting one pound per week under their let's scrap VAT proposal of people's energy bills. Well, that's not going to go very far. And ironically, the only reason we can even entertain cutting VAT is because we've left the EU something which all Labour MPs so unanimously opposed. Um, but this is a chance for a government who are taking the cost of living crisis seriously. That's why what we've announced today is £300 support per household, which will go an awful long way. I've been on GB News before talking about why we should look at cutting the extra 5% of fuel bills. I still maintain that would be a good thing to do, but it's a bit rich Labour MPs talking about that when we can only do it because we've left the EU, which they oppose doing in the first place. Let's move on to levelling up, because as I say, the Prime Minister has been in Blackpool today where we are, and he's been talking to lots of people, and you're right in pointing out you know, this is the part of the country, frankly, this is a city that needs levelling up. I think uh, eight of the ten most deprived parts um, of the country are in Blackpool. Absolutely, that's the case. Um, what, what is levelling up? How can we measure it? How can you turn around in two, two and a half years' time to your constituents and say, that we've started to level up, we've done this, this and this, that you can actually notice? Levelling up for me is two parts. Firstly, it's making sure that a child in Blackpool has the same life chances as a child in Brighton, Bournemouth or Bedford, for example. So what does that mean? Well, it means more money going into schools to make sure they're getting the support and the skills they need. Blackpool is one of the new education investment areas. It means more money in the NHS, local mental health services, to close the disproportionate gaps in life expectancy between places like Blackpool and the South. So all that investment is going in in terms of more money to public services. The second side of that is a more immediate aspect to levelling up. So when we leave this hotel, what can we see? Where's the new um, regeneration opportunities? Where are the new businesses? And on that side of the coin, Blackpool has a brilliant story to tell. £40 million extra from the government in a towns deal, the largest single towns deal of any town in the country. And I've just been with the Prime Minister and Michael Gove, and we've been looking at some of the uh, projects on the ground where we've already seen projects kick-started, spades in the ground, and that regeneration being delivered. Scott, you know and that's levelling up to me. You, you know what I want to say here? Well, one of the tangible things might be, for example, the high street. Yes. I walked along the promenade. In fact, we're just seeing it on the TV now, um, earlier on today. And there was a Woolworths. It still had the sign up, an old Woolworths store. Woolworths closed in 2009. You got elected, or this, this government, the Conservative Party, were elected in 2010, 12 years ago. That store is still empty. A Woolworths store in the city, still empty. How can local people or anyone across the country believe that the Conservative Party are going to level up when you've had 12 years in power and frankly, physically, like in this city, things don't seem to have changed at all. Well, let's put this conversation into context. Blackpool's had a Labour MP before I was elected in a Labour you, council you know, for years and yeah, years Yeah, but you know, years. I mean, governments and run the country, well, though. people didn't trust those Labour politicians to deliver levelling up because they'd been here for years when we'd had a Tory national government and people kicked them out at the last election because they didn't see any progress on the ground. So things don't happen overnight. The high street faces challenges. Towns such as Blackpool face systemic challenges on so many different levels. But we have a government here who is putting forward the cash, where money where its mouth is, to try and tackle these long-term problems which have persisted for decades. So just where I've been with the Prime Minister today, £17 million for a new tram station, £15 million government investment to the new Winter Gardens, where the Conservative Party will be holding its conference in six weeks' time, and other investment opportunities we've seen today. So what we are seeing is real money coming into places like Blackpool for the first time in decades from a yeah, Tory government. Yeah, but also previously from a Conservative government. I mean, that's the weird thing. I don't know whether you're disassociating yourself with David Cameron and Theresa May and essentially saying, well, we're a new government, we're not really like them. Is, is that what it is? Because I, I don't really get it. I mean, if you look at lots of measurements, whether it's a falling population, whether it's uh, life expectancy here or birth rates, you know, lots of them have got worse over the last 12 years under a Conservative government. And, and I can't work out whether you're just disassociating yourself with what's happening in the past. Well, this is a different type of Conservative government. What we saw at the last election was the Conservatives winning seats, Blackpool South, Burnley, Bishop Auckland, in some cases we'd never held, and that was for two reasons. Firstly, because people believed in the Prime Minister, and still do, and wanted him to 
face and um, knock down barriers which were facing them in their own private lives. And secondly, because of this concept of levelling up. So if you live in Blackpool or Burnley, your town hadn't seen investment from governments, red and blue, for decade after decade after decade. And I think people now see that's changing with real investment from the government. OK, Scott Benton, good to see you. Good to be in Blackpool. Thank you very much indeed for your time uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. OK, you're watching GB News and The Briefing. It is 22 minutes past 3 o'clock. Going to take a quick break here in Blackpool. In just a couple of minutes, they're going to be live in Northern Ireland with the very latest. A storm of descends into crisis. The First Minister, they're likely to resign in the next couple of hours. We'll be talking about that in just a couple of minutes. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood, and every weekday we bring you The Briefing live from 9.30am. The stories, analysis and live debate that you need to hear. Quite right, uh, uh, Tom, of course. Was this something that had been considered at all? Difficult to answer. Gas-guzzling helicopters circling. Noise is being made here! Joe Biden walking out. Thank you very much for joining us. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, Monday to Friday, 9.30am on GB News. Join me, Gloria De Piero, Monday to Thursday at noon for The Briefing. We go to the parts of Parliament that you won't see elsewhere. Plus, there's exclusive interviews with MPs from all parties. But quite often, they paper over the real truth. Why does a working class lad like you join the Tories? That's a good question. Don't miss it. Monday to Thursdays at noon on GB News. Uh, very welcome back to The Briefing with me, Darren McCaffrey, live from Blackpool on this Thursday afternoon. Uh, do get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.uk, particularly if you live here in Blackpool or the North West where we've been all week, or you can tweet us 
at uh, GB News. I'm going to get to some of your views a little later on in the programme. But first, let's turn to uh, Northern Ireland now, where it looks like the First Minister, Paul Given, is likely to resign in the next couple of hours. It comes after uh, Edwin Poots, the Agriculture Minister there, yesterday uh, ordered civil servants to stop checks on goods travelling from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. Uh, as a part, of course, of the Northern Ireland Protocol, that trade deal between the EU, EU and the UK. Uh, though reports this morning that civil servants are carrying on uh, looking at uh, goods coming in to Northern Ireland. Uh, though, the, of course, the resignation of Paul Given uh, this afternoon would cause a crisis at Storm and effectively bring down uh, the executive there. Well, let's get the very latest now and join a former DUP MP and uh, political commentator, Emma little Pengeli. Emma, thank you very much indeed uh, for mm -hmm. joining us. Just give us a sense, uh, as someone who's within the DUP tent, if you like, about why the First Minister needs or feels the need to resign. So you will be aware this is a very long running issue around the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, this was announced, of course, by the Prime Minister back at the end of 2019. Um, and the implementation of this protocol has caused serious concerns really since. There's been a series of negotiations over the last two to three years. But this is very much unionists and the Democratic Unionist Party saying look, enough is enough. There's been all of this discussion, all of this negotiation. These issues are not yet resolved and therefore they have stated a plan about how to ramp up uh, the issues to try to emphasise to the UK government how serious this is. In saying that though, Emma, my understanding is even if the executive collapses, it doesn't necessarily mean that storm collapses in the sense that the UK government is bringing in legislation which will mean uh, that it will be able to or ministers will be able to function at least uh, for the next couple of months ahead of an election in May. Yes, as you've just mentioned, there is an election here in May of this year. So we really had about two to three months of this um, particular Northern Ireland Assembly left. Um, the First Minister resigning will not necessarily bring that down in, in that sense, but it does do a number of really key things. First of all, it removes the ability of the executive to make decisions because if the First Minister resigns, then that automatically resigns the Deputy First Minister, and that's held by Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill. So it sends a very, very strong message Basically, ministers would remain in post, but they can really only do the types of things that ministers could do during an election campaign, for example. So they can't make new policy, they wouldn't be able to get anything um, agreed by the executive, and they couldn't bring forward new legislation, for example, um, or progress legislation that, that, that they're currently um, holding. So look, this is a very serious move by the DUP. Um, they had set that out um, some months ago. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, the DUP leader, had outlined this in a speech back in September of last year. Um, but there was still the sense that people were not taking uh, the concern seriously. Look, there's not a single unionist representative anywhere in Northern Ireland that supports this protocol. We've seen major issues in terms of trade, trade diversion of, of uh, suppliers and, and companies starting to look for um, goods uh, in Europe in the European Union and in, in Ireland as opposed to the Great British market. We've seen prices rise um, for companies being passed on to consumers. Um, so there's a whole range of problems here. We've seen um, GB uh, businesses withdraw from the Northern Ireland market. So the, the unionist view is that this is really bad for the union. It's bad for the people of Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland has been left behind um, as the rest of the UK has Brexited. And it, quite frankly, two to three years down the line, it's not good enough. It needs to be resolved with the European Union and, and there needs to be action by the UK government. Just finally on this, though, it's also been bad for the DUP, and let's be frank about this, a big motivation, maybe possibly the main motivation for this resignation today, is politics. The DUP are putting a marker in the line to try and appear tough ahead of an election because the poll ratings are taking an absolute hammering in recent months. That's the truth of the matter, isn't it? Well, the protocol has been very unpopular with unionists, there's no doubt about that. But of course, political rivals of the DUP has made this allegation that it's about the elections, about politics. But I think that completely underestimates how genuinely the DUP and unionists really feel about the union with the United Kingdom, how much that they feel that this protocol is damaging that. But the court has held that, that in fact, um, key aspects of the Act of Union have been repealed. So, you know, I don't think people should misunderstand, you know, you shouldn't misunderstand that this is a very genuine concern and issue. People are angry on the ground. People involved in unionist politics are very angry about this. They want to see these changes because they see the big dangers in this 
for our Union of our United Kingdom. Okay, uh, Emma, appreciate your time and your analysis this afternoon. That's Emma Little Pengangeli joining us uh, there from uh, Belfast. Thank you, Emma. Uh, you're watching the briefing here on GB News. Uh, someone getting in touch about that Woolworths sign because we're in Blackpool. Uh, saying apparently it was occupied by Poundlands until uh, last year. Uh, Poundlands relocated, but apparently my point still holds about levelling up, and that's what we're going to be talking about uh, next. Our coverage live from Blackpool continues in just a couple of minutes. Do get in touch, GB News at GBNews.uk. UK. But first, let's head back to London for all the latest news in the studio. It's 3.32. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. The energy regulator Ofgem has announced a 54% rise in the price cap. Those on default tariffs paying by direct debit will see their bills go up by nearly £700 and prepayment customers face annual charges of more than £2,000. The change will be introduced from April the 1st, affecting around 22 million customers. Chancellor Rishi Sunak says he'll give households in council tax bands A to D an extra £350 to ease the burden. The Bank of England has raised interest rates to 0.5% and signalled more hikes are on the way as it tries to curb inflation. It marks the central bank's first back-to-back -back increase since June 2004. Northern Ireland's First Minister Paul Given is expected to resign today. It comes amid increasing tensions over the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Officials were ordered to stop agri-food checks. That's potentially a breach of international law. Hauliers are calling for clarity as lorries are still being received, but it's not clear whether inspections are going ahead. U.S. special forces say the leader of ISIS has been killed in northwest Syria. President Joe Biden announced that Abu Ibrahim al-Hashimi al-Qurashi has now been removed from the battlefield and there were no U.S. casualties. Al-Qurashi reportedly detonated a bomb as U.S. forces approached during an overnight raid, killing himself and at least 13 others, including women and children. TV online and DAB Plus radio, this is GB News. We'll have a full update at the top of the hour. After the break, it's back to the briefing with Darren McCaffrey. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Uh, a very good afternoon. Welcome back to the briefing here on GB News. It is 36 minutes past three o'clock on this Thursday afternoon. We're live here in Blackpool. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your company. Uh, we've been travelling around uh, the northwest uh, this week. We've been in Macclesfield, Burnley, and now we're by the seaside in sunny Blackpool. And it is very sunny indeed uh, today. Uh, let's bring you up to date, though, with some breaking news in the last couple of minutes. And it's been revealed that uh, Munra Miz Mizza, sorry, the head of policy at Downing Street has just resigned in the last couple of minutes. Uh, very, very unhappy about the Prime Minister's attack. You may remember this on Monday in the House of Commons uh, around Keir Starmer and Jimmy Savile, uh, essentially what many viewed as a slur against the former uh, Director of Public Constitutions, who's now the Labour Party uh, leader that wasn't really backed up by evidence. Uh, well, in a letter this afternoon, she's written that I believe it was wrong. This is of the Prime Minister for you to imply this week that Keir Starmer was personally responsible for allowing Jimmy Savile to escape justice. There was no fair or reasonable basis for that assertion. This was not the usual cut and thrust of politics. It was an inappropriate and partisan reference to an horrendous case of child sex abuse. You tried to clarify your position today, but despite my urging, you did not apologise for misleading the impression you give. It must be said the Prime Minister here in Blackpool today did essentially go back on those comments, suggesting that he was not holding Keir Starmer personally responsible. But clearly, this afternoon, the head of policy at Downing Street does not think that has gone far enough, and she has resigned. This is a very significant political development, and frankly, it is the last thing uh, that Boris Johnson needs uh, right now. The head of his policy at number 10 resigning in the last hour or so, uh, saying that the Prime Minister was not fair or reasonable in that assertion against Keir Starmer and that it was not put part of the cut and thrust of politics. It was inappropriate and a partisan reference to an horrendous case of child sex abuse. Uh, hopefully we'll get uh, possibly speaking to Tom Harwood, our political correspondent, about this a little later on in the programme. Um, we are in Blackpool and we have got uh, Tony Williams, who's the head of the Conservative Party here in uh, Blackpool, who joins us in the studio. Uh, Tony, very good afternoon to you. And we're going to get on to, uh, obviously, other things, in, uh, uh, as we will, about levelling up and why the Prime Minister uh, was here. Th this is a very significant blow for the Prime Minister. I mean, the, the head of policy inside Downing Street, she has worked for Boris Johnson yeah. for years, uh, and she is saying this afternoon that she tried to get the Prime Minister to apologise and he just wouldn't do so. It is damaging, without a shadow of a doubt. How, why has British politics sunk so low as this? I mean, there are some national, international incidents going on and we're arguing over parties and comments made. Um, I'm not happy about it, obviously. I don't think anyone can be pleased that this is going on at all. But no one's above the law. It's as simple as that. And starting with Partygate, if if you make the laws, then you have to stand by them. And Boris has to, has to do that. Do you, I think do, should, do you think he should go then? It would be a shame if it came to that, because I think Boris has got a great deal of talent. I think he's done some sterling work in certain areas. And it would be a shame that if we, we did lose him in that sense, but he's a man of his own making. That's as simple as that. Uh, but I come back to this. You, you said, you know, no one is above the law. You know, th this is, by the way, this resignation today is linked to the reaction to the Sue Gray report. It's, sure. You know, it's part of the politics of all of this, but, you know, it's a reminder of the Prime Minister's ability to step on landmines that he makes. And what we know that he was urged by his own advisers before, frankly, that pretty difficult, maybe disastrous comments appearance on Monday not yeah. to do this. He went ahead and done it. He's now lost his head of policy, someone who's worked for him for years. I mean, I suppose my ultimate question is, when does this end? Isn't the fear that this just... The Conservative Party gets stop? bogged down in it? Yeah, when does it stop? Why, when do we get on with the business and, and stop this? Um, it isn't anything new. Politicians breaking rules that they make is not new. You can go back to Lloyd George, who was accused of insider dealing. It's been happening for years. But I think we live in a society now where news is news brand new every day and it's programs like yourself where you can drop in and drop out and it's so significant that whatever the wrongdoing happens in parliament it's immediately taken up and i think there's a lot of political warmongering going on because of this when a man's down you kick him it's as simple as that phrase but i'll repeat it no one is above the law but, but I, I i just want to end on this but 
but isn't this in some ways different? You're right, you know, of course, politicians have broken role, r yeah. rules and sometimes laws before, and sometimes they face the consequences, sometimes they haven't. Isn't the reason that this is maybe different, why it resonated more, is because actually everyone has been through an incredibly difficult two years. Oh, true. And they, lots of people stuck by those rules, but, and they went through horrendous things, yeah. not going to funerals or saying loved ones die. And that's why maybe this is different from those incidents. It you is talk different. About. You're absolutely right. I mean, a lot of people were affected by the lockdown. But aren't, aren't the people in Britain, we're, we're just so well behaved. You know, it's a lockdown. You can't do this, you can't do that. And on the majority, on the whole, that's what the people of Britain have done. So the person who's made those rules or has announced those rules, because I don't think Boris himself would probably have made the decisions, I think they would have come from his advisers, uh, they, they just can't break them. If they make them, they can't break them. If you were an MP, would you hand in your letter? I'd have to weigh up the balance. I'd have to weigh up the balance. I think the Jimmy Savile situation was, was terrible. I didn't... I cringed when I heard it. I just thought there was no need for that. And it wasn't a personal attack, as he said today, but it appeared to be at the time. I would be on the consideration list for handing in my letter, yes. Uh, just, just to remind you, uh, just to talk through this, if you're not aware of what was said, uh, the Prime Minister today, when he was asked about this, about the Jimmy Savile incident, uh, clearly under pressure from his own advisers to apologise for it, said, I'm not talking about Keir Starmer's personal record with the DUP, DPP, sorry, the Director of Public Prosecutions. Totally understand he had nothing to do personally with those directions when it comes to Jimmy Savile. But in the Commons on Monday, his words were... He, being Keir Starmer, spent most of his time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile, which was an direct attack. He did roll back from it today, but clearly not far enough. His head of policy has resigned, and we will be talking about that later. Tony, I don't want to take up all the time about that, because we're on Blackpool. We're sure. talking about levelling up. The Prime Minister's been here uh, today. You've lived here, I assume, pretty much all your life. Yeah, since um, I was 12. And, 30. you know, Blackpool's had a pretty rough time, not in the last 10 years, 20 years, you know, going back a long time. But, frankly, the Conservative government have been in power, haven't they, for the last... 12 years yep. and many people are asking why have they not done this before well they have done it and they've done it in stages we just got 40 billion pounds in the high street funding from the government and there's been lots of other sort of awards and funding been given to for some of the problems we've got so to say they've been disingenuous or they haven't been sort of I don't know very fortunate towards Blackpool, I was looking for the right word, it would be wrong. They have. They've really been very good to us. And our two Conservative MPs have worked very hard to get some of that funding. But the levelling up is not new. I mean, this has been talked about for quite some time. And the 12 points I've seen today in the report um, very much look like the industry changes that Theresa May wanted to bring in as well. So it, it isn't new, it's needed. There's always been a north-south divide economically. And in Blackpool, we need those apprenticeships. We need that investment. We need to get people educated to skill level. Yeah. Tony, appreciate your time. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. Good to see you in Blackpool. Good to be here. Uh, thank you for having us. That's Tony Williams there, who is the leader of the Conservatives here in Blackpool. Thank you very much indeed. For, uh, joining us. OK, well, let's get a reaction to all of this. Uh, let's go uh, to the Labour Party and to Peter Dowd. He is the former Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury at Labour MP and joins us now. Uh, very good afternoon to you, Peter. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are uh, live afternoon. here in Blackpool. You're down the line. Uh, Peter, I suppose, first of all, what's your reaction uh, to the head of policy at Downing Street resigning uh, this afternoon uh, over those words uttered by the Prime Minister about Keir Starmer and Jimmy Savile? Well, I'm glad someone's got some morality in 10 Downing Street to take that action. It was an absolutely disgraceful thing that the Prime Minister said, and I think it's typical of his off the snidey, sort of below the belt approach to, um, to politics. And at least, as I say, someone's got the gumption and the moral fortitude to do the right thing and resign from a, a regime, because that's what it is, which is pretty uh, disgraceful. Um, in, let's move on to levelling up, though, because we're talking, of course, and we're here in Blackpool, you're in Liverpool, uh, aren't you? Uh, the government's putting an awful lot more attention on places like Blackpool and other parts of the north of England that, frankly, have been forgotten, not just by previous Conservative governments, but indeed by Labour governments 
at two. That is welcome news, surely. Well, I think it's got to be in the context of that the past 12 years in particular, the amount of uh, cuts to, for example, a local authority, the, 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 the councillor before, I mean, I understand, for example, Blackpool Council have got another 30 odd million pounds worth of cuts to make over the next five years. I think that's in addition to the 20 million they've made in the last year or two. There have been massive cuts in local government expenditure. There haven't been, we haven't had in the past 12 years an upkeep, if you want, a, a proper upkeep in terms of the expenditure on the NHS. Investment in infrastructure is pretty grim. And that's why we're in the situation we're in, because it's 12 years now, virtually. Of austerity, cut after cut after cut, with low growth in the economy, wages in the boots, the lowest wage rises since the Napoleonic Wars. No wonder we're in the state we are. And to compare that to the investment that the Labour government made between 1997 and 2010 is grotesque. The reality is we haven't had the investment that we needed. And can I just make one other point? You know, during the financial crisis, the, the, the state backed up those banks who created that problem in the first place to the tune of about 1.3 billion trillion, 1.3 trillion pounds in, in funding, in grants, in guarantees. The COVID crisis has cost us thus far 400 billion. We're, 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 we're still far away from the cost of the financial crisis. And if the state can afford that to bankroll banks who got us into the mess in the first place, they can certainly bank the investment the likes of Blackpool and Liverpool and Bootle and Sefton and other parts of the country need as well. But, but Peter, just finally on this, but isn't the point that the Conservative Party make about that, which is a reasonably fair one, is that no Labour government have left office with employment at lower than it was when they went in. And frankly, you know, you're a former Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. You know, the previous one in government, Liam Byrne, left him out saying the money had all run out. I mean, if the money's run out, it takes years to get things back in, back in order, frankly. That's why well, Labour's not necessarily I, trusting I the economy like... still. I don't mind, look, I don't mind bandying statistics around, but that's a grotesque simplification of the situation in relation to unemployment. And that's just not the case. The reality is, with the Labour government, a Labour government invested in our country. The comment that Leon Byrne made, frankly, most financial chief secretaries to the Treasury made a similar comment. It was a Joke, maybe it was an inappropriate joke, but they all made very similar comments. That was that was a like tradition to do. So let's get it into context. The bottom line is the government have decided that it's not investing in the country, and it should be, and that leads to low growth in the economy. Low growth in the economy leads to low levels of wage low levels of investment in social care, in our infrastructure, and I keep on going on about that. It's investment that is needed, and this government simply hasn't invested. And the money that the Blackpool Council will get, £30 million, is a drop in the ocean compared to what it's had cut in the past 12 years. Let's put it into that context, shall we? OK. Peter, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us here on GB News. Peter Dodd, uh, Labour MP uh, for Bootle. Joining us uh, from Liverpool this afternoon, Peter, thank you. Uh, just to bring you up to date, that breaking news, of course, in the last couple of minutes, the head of policy at number 10, one of Boris Johnson's longest-serving aides, has resigned in the last uh, hour or so uh, over, of course, uh, that slur that Boris Johnson made uh, against the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, prior, uh, sorry, in the Commons on Monday. Uh, she said in her resignation note that she believed it was wrong to imply that Keir Starmer was personally responsible for allowing Jimmy Savile to escape justice. There was no fair or reasonable basis for that assertion, and she has quit number 10. Delighted to say, joining me live in Blackpool this afternoon to sum up a dramatic week in politics and indeed economics, we've got Liam Hallican, our economics and business editor, and Bradley Harris, our North West reporter. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Liam, let's start with this. This is a very, most people have never heard of this person, but she's been by Boris Johnson's side for a long time. This is a very, very significant moment. Manira Mears is one of the most influential people you've never heard of. This is a person who embodies you know, British social mobility. Her parents came over 
immigrant from Pakistan. Her father was a factory worker. She grew up in Oldham, just outside Manchester. Got herself a place at Oxford from a sixth form college. Got herself a PhD. She was key to Boris Johnson when he was London mayor. She was his deputy mayor for education and for culture. And as soon as he became prime minister back in July 2019, she became head of the number 10 policy unit. She's a consummate political insider. She's married to Doogie Smith, who's another former uh, advisor viewers won't have heard of, but very, very influential too. And just when Boris Johnson is trying to say, I learnt the lessons of Partygate, I learnt the lessons about lockdown shenanigans with birthday cake, I'm going to rebuild my Downing Street team. He's tried to appoint a se senior civil servant called Antonia Romeo, coming from the Ministry of Justice. She's seen as a rising star, possibly a future cabinet secretary. She doesn't want to go and run this number 10 office of the prime minister. And now he's lost the head head of the Downing Street policy unit. One, one of the people that MPs quite respected. You know, one of the growing up. Because she kind of gets it. She, when she talks about levelling up, she's drawing on her childhood experience. She is a, the genuine article in terms of the Conservatives trying to present themselves as a party of social mobility, as a party that can reach into former Labour strongholds and understand what ordinary people need. To lose her now, the timing is very damaging. Uh, someone saying this afternoon, this feels like, you know, the real ravens leaving the tower stuff, i.e., you know, is this people getting, getting off the ship as it sinks, frankly? Well, look, let's be completely clear. Let's just turn the telescope round and look at it from another perspective, if only for the purposes of discussion. Once you've been head of the Downing Street Policy Unit, you can, it's basically a meal ticket for the rest of your life. You can make an awful lot of cash in the private sector. And I'm not saying this is what's on Manira Mirza's mind now. If she says she's upset about these comments relating to Keir Starmer, then I, you know, I take her at her word. She is upset. But there does come a time when people, particularly those who work in the back rooms of politics and are known to be very, very influential, they want a change of life. They want to get out of the glare. The night, you know, it's not a nine to five job. It's a 24 hour round the clock job. She's been on the political front line with Boris Johnson for a long time. And who knows if he does really want to build the policy infrastructure around him so his government doesn't seem coherent. So there does seem to be a strategy, does seem to be a Johnsonism type of conservatism that his backbenchers and the party can get behind. The Prime Minister may be looking for new faces, so it may have been a mutual decision, I don't know. Uh, Bradley, let's bring you in. Um, yeah, I mean, you spend more time talking to ordinary folk probably than anyone else. It's your job uh, and you're doing incredibly well. What's your sense of where politics is with people who actually aren't as engaged as the rest of us are? Yeah, well, look, you know, here in Blackpool, there's around 140,000 people. Uh, I've been speaking to a lot of them in the last 24 hours. And do you know what? To my surprise, actually, they are engaged. They are across what's going on in Downing Street more than we think. Mm. Um, uh, and they want to know what's going on. These are people who are in charge of how their lives are going to develop in the future. In terms that we've heard today in Liam's show on the money about those increases in the cost of living, that is having a direct impact on people, particularly from April. People will be clutching their pockets and counting out the pounds and pennies uh, in the next few months when we hear about those energy bills going up by not just a few pounds, hundreds of pounds. So, yeah, people are aware of what the government are doing and certainly aware of the impact it's having on their everyday lives. Uh, and, and just very, very finally, briefly, Bradley, just in terms of party gates, I mean, is it resonating? A lot of our viewers say, we're not interested, we're bored of it, we want to move on. What's your sense beyond GB News viewers? Yeah, well, certainly on our Northwest Week Roadshow uh, in Macclesfield, uh, in Burnley, and today in Blackpool, there are actually a lot of people who are in support of the Prime Minister and actually mm. saying anybody in his position uh, might have slipped up like this, but you've got to look at the important things that he's done with the vaccination programme, the most successful within Europe. You know, you've got to look at things uh, such as Brexit. People who voted for Brexit say he got us out of it. So yeah. for many people, they are the things that they remember. OK, Bradley and Liam, as always, thank you very much indeed. As Bradley said, we've been in Macclesfield, Burnley and Blackpool this week. And we're going to be here for the next couple of hours because Nigel Farage is live in this very room at 7 p.m. tonight. You will not want to miss that. Arlene Foster is back at three tomorrow with the latest on the storm and crisis. Up next, though, it is Colin Brazier from four to six. But before all that, let's bring you an update with the weather. Thanks for watching. See you soon.
Hello again. Mild today, but a big change on the way. Tomorrow it's going to feel an awful lot colder. A wet and windy spell will push across the country overnight and that will introduce the colder and in places more wintry weather from this cold front. There it is sweeping south, moving away the mild air that's been with us for a number of days and introducing much colder air, feeling colder still with the strength of the wind. There's the weather front pushing into the northwest tonight. Heavy rain for a time and some snow over the hills and it sinks southwards into northern England and Wales, so a spell of an hour or two of heavy rain, uh, followed by some hill snow. And the showers turning more and more wintry across the northwest. Things could turn icy here as temperatures tumble, staying mild, though, across the southeast for the time being. But as this band of wet weather sinks south across the Midlands, then into parts of East Anglia and the southeast, there could be a little bit of snow for a time. Not expected to cause too many issues, but... You may see that in the morning. Ice is a bigger hazard across western Scotland and Northern Ireland with showers here on Friday morning. And again, a mixture of sleet, hail and some snow. The snow is only really expected to build up over hills. Sunny spells for many then during Friday, but there will be showers almost anywhere. And again, they'll have a wintry flavour to them and it will feel a lot colder. That cold feel continues through Friday evening. The showers will tend to fade, though, in most places. And then we're looking at uh, more wet weather coming into the northwest on Saturday. As that hits the colder air, that will have a bit of snow mixed in again for a time across parts of Scotland. But looking like outbreaks of rain and drizzle for Northern Ireland, Northern England, pushing into Wales on Saturday. Much of the south and east of England staying dry and bright for most of the day. But it's going to be windy again, and that'll be the case throughout this weekend. Sunday, again, windy with a bit more patchy rain across the south. Some further wintry showers across the north. Weather chopping and changing quite a bit at the moment. Bye for now. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hi there, coming up.